Hubble is down right now. JWST sees the first protoplanetary disk in another galaxy. Titan Dragonfly is getting delayed and the first full image of the Chinese space station from orbit. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. We've been watching as the Lucy mission is continuing on its way out to Jupiter's Trojan region, and it made its first asteroid flyby of Dinkinish. And when it did that, it made the surprising discovery that this asteroid has a moon. And not only a moon, but the moon is actually a contact binary, where you've got two asteroids sort of gently resting together in orbit around the larger asteroid. That's pretty cool. But in fact, these objects, these contact binaries are pretty common across the solar system. We've seen several examples of them in the past. And it's estimated that they're probably about 30% of the objects in the solar system. That's a lot. And so like that means like one of the major classifications of objects we don't exactly know how they come together and form. And so there's a new paper that I just loved where they're proposing that we should just make one. And of course, we learned with the DART mission that if you slam a impactor into an asteroid, you can slow down its orbit. You actually change how long it takes for that object to orbit another one. And so if we can find a pair of asteroids that are pretty close to each other, then in theory, we should be able to do a impact mission into one of those asteroids and that will slow down their orbit and the two will get much closer to the point that they might actually become a contact binary. And then this would give astronomers a chance to watch sort of in fast motion how these contact binaries form. Of course, it's very tricky because you've got to hit this object in exactly the right spot. Think about when you're playing a game of billiards, you've got to hit the target precisely with the right velocity so that the two asteroids spin down and gently touch with each other. But it's pretty cool. I like that. Man, like the dinosaurs would be so proud of what we can do with asteroids. Hubble is down for now. All right, bad news. The Hubble Space Telescope is out of operation right now. We got an announcement from NASA that they decided to take the spacecraft offline on the 23rd of November. It appears that they were getting faulty readings from one of the gyroscopes on board the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, if you've been watching my content for any period of time, this should be something that strikes fear into your heart. Gyroscopes on spacecraft. When the Hubble Space Telescope was serviced back in 2009, one of the big reasons why was because it was out of gyroscopes. And these gyroscopes are these big spinning wheels inside the telescope that it uses to reorient itself to point in different directions. And once it runs out of gyroscopes, then it can no longer direct itself and be able to be used for really sensitive astronomy. It was replenished to six. Now it's down to three. And one of them is maybe slightly glitching. Now it could just be temporary and NASA will do some work and they'll get it back online and then the problem goes away. Or it might be that this is the beginning of a failure for another gyro. And in theory, Hubble can operate all the way down to one gyro. So there's still more gyros to go. And yet, these things fail. The rest of the telescope is doing fine. There's no problem with any of its science instruments. Everything's fine. It's just the gyros. So hopefully they'll be able to diagnose the problem, they'll make it go away, and then they'll get the telescope back online in, in a couple of weeks and everything will be fine. Let's hope. If it does fail, there's still one other possibility, and that is that NASA is in talks with a company called Polaris that is proposing that they try to do another servicing mission on the Hubble Space Telescope using a Crew Dragon. And I really like this idea because it's sort of like a not space station target for Crew Dragon. It gives it another goal and yet it would do some serious work and it would be a lot less expensive than the repair missions done with the space shuttle. I really hope they push this forward and maybe this is incentive to go faster. Webb sees a double protostar. Now we've been showing you a lot of images of protostars and these are a type of object known as a Herbig Harrow object. Now when a star first forms out of a giant cloud of gas and dust, it you know, starts to collapse down on its mutual gravity and then as it does, it starts to spin up faster and faster and then you get this 
core at the heart of the gas cloud, this is the new star, the protostar. For about 500,000 years, the star is siphoning in material from this solar nebula, building up its mass. And for a period of about 10,000 years, it creates these polar jets where you've got outflowing materials. It's essentially feeding on material too quickly. It gets these magnetic fields that churn around the star and it gets these polar outflow jets. And we've seen many examples of these. And of course, Webb is the perfect telescope. It's able to look through the gas and dust, be able to see the protostar as it's spinning up, as these outflows are coming out of the area around the protoplanetary disk. One object that astronomers have been watching is called HH797. Herbig Harrow 797. And it was unusual because it had these outflows, but the outflows had material that was moving at different speeds. Very strange. Thanks to Webb, astronomers were able to realize that it's not one star, but it's actually two stars, a binary set of stars that are orbiting around each other. And then they've both got polar outflows coming from their outflows. And so they're both setting out these parallel outflows at different speeds. And that explains the weird measurements they were getting from the jets that were coming out of the star. And these protoplanetary disks are showing up all over the place. So there's another survey done by Webb in a really cool nebula called the Lobster Nebula. It's located about 6,000 astronomical units away. And it has a lot of really large stars in it. And astronomers were looking at a very specific type of star called an OB star. And one of the big questions is like, if you have a really massive star, do you get the same kind of planetary system forming just at a larger scale? So they looked at 15 of these newly forming OB stars with James Webb, and they found that they could observe protoplanetary disks around them. And in fact, they were able to resolve regions within 10 astronomical units of the star itself. So think about it like the distance from the Earth to the sun is one astronomical unit. So 10 times that distance, and they were able to measure specific elements at the center of this protoplanetary disk. And they were able to find that there are the kinds of elements that go to make up planets. So it seems like yes, that even the most massive stars get these protoplanetary disks forming around them. And then astronomers found a protoplanetary disk in another galaxy. So in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is one of the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, everything's extreme. Some of the largest star forming regions in our neighborhood is in the Large Magellanic Cloud. They have some of the most massive stars that have ever been seen. We had the recent supernova in 1987, like everything's more extreme in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And so you wouldn't be surprised to know that Herbig Harrow objects are also extreme. Back to that first story, right? These are these newly forming protostars and astronomers had found one of these in the Large Magellanic Cloud and it was monstrous. They think that the star itself has about 12 times the mass of the sun and it has these polar outflows that were stretching out about 33 light years away from the star. And so that's a very big object, even though it's very far away, about 165,000 light years away, it's very big in the sky, comparatively. So they did follow on observations with Alma to try and get a sense of these polar outflows. And what they saw was at the center, they were able to detect a gas cloud rotating around the star. So in other words, back to the previous story, they were able to detect a protoplanetary disk around one of the more massive types of star in another galaxy. Thanks, Webb. Every week, we give you a chance to vote on what you thought was the best story of the week. And the winner last week was Starship. Now, technically, we already gave it the award on the previous week. And so the next one was the new images of the core of the Milky Way from James Webb. So I think that's the one we're gonna go for this week because Starship already won two weeks ago. Now we post a new vote every week into the community tab on our channel. And if you want a chance to participate in the vote, find out if what you think is the most exciting story matches what other people think is the most exciting story, vote. We release it about a day after the video. We wanna give people a chance to actually watch the video before they vote. Informed voting. So the best way to do that is subscribe to our channel, click on the notification bell, and then you will be informed when the new Space Bites video is up, and then you can expect to see the vote shortly after that. The second most energetic cosmic ray ever found. Cosmic rays are particles flying through space, 
and astronomers detect them as they collide into the atmosphere of the Earth. They collide, they crash with particles of air, they scatter into a bunch of smaller particles, and these sort of rain down across a region of Earth. And so astronomers have set up giant telescope arrays, which are separated in some cases by tens of kilometers apart, that are looking up and they're waiting for these showers of detections to hit them. And so back in 1991, astronomers detected what they called the Oh my god particle. And this was the most energetic cosmic ray particle ever seen. It had 320 million tera electron volts. How much is that? That is the equivalent amount of energy as you taking a brick at about waist height and dropping it on your foot. It's also about 40 million times more energetic than anything particle physicists have been able to make in the lab. Like think about the Large Hadron Collider, 40 million times more than that. And like Side note, uh, one of the worries that physicists had when they were first developing the Large Hadron Collider was, are we going to destroy the universe with this thing? And so they did the math. They said, well, you know, based on the energies involved as we create particles, is there some chance that we're going to cause the universe to unravel, collapse? And then they realized that you've got these cosmic ray particles that are crashing into the atmosphere 40 million times more energetic than anything can be done in the Large Hadron Collider. And so until our ability to collide particles matches that, the universe is safe. And so recently astronomers detected the second most energetic particle. You know, not as powerful as that first one, but still pretty extreme. And so it really makes you wonder what is the source of these things? Because these cosmic rays, they have so much energy that they really aren't affected by the magnetic fields of galaxies or stars or things they pass close by, like wherever they came from, that should be the source. And yet they appear to come from nowhere. Like there's nothing, no supernova associated, no supermassive black hole, they're coming out of nowhere. And so this is still an ongoing mystery in astronomy. Although one other possibility, like most cosmic rays are protons, they are hydrogen atoms, but you can get them made of other things, you can go all the way up the periodic table of elements to even like iron. And so if you have a much heavier element like iron, then you can get the energies involved without it necessarily having to have so much energy invested into a proton. So we're still waiting to figure out what is the source of these high energy cosmic rays. Where are all the double planets? In the solar system, we have single planets. So like think about the Earth and the Moon, right? You've got the Earth and it's orbited by the Moon. But that's not actually what's happening. In fact, the Earth and the Moon are orbiting a common center of gravity. It's just that that point is inside the Earth. Now, if you go out to Pluto and Charon, that common center of gravity, the Barry Center, is outside of Pluto. And so the two are orbiting around this empty spot in space. And if you had two planets that were exactly the same mass, then they would be orbiting around each other. It seems like you should get these kinds of things. And yet astronomers haven't found very many candidate double exoplanets across the universe. So far we know of like three, and we're not even super certain that this is the case. But like, are they possible? So researchers have been attempting to simulate these. But there's a method where planets can stabilize themselves using tidal dissipation. When you think about, say, how the Earth and the Moon are orbiting around each other, the Moon is tidally locked to the Earth. The Earth is slowing down its rotation speed and eventually it'll be locked to the Moon. Pluto and Charon are locked to each other. The additional energy has been dissipated away and now they're locked together. And researchers did some simulations and found that yes, you should be able to get these double planets across the universe. So where are they? Now we've been producing a lot of content here on the channel, many, many interviews and I get a lot of feedback from people that they really enjoy the interviews that we're doing. And I'm glad because I really enjoy conducting them. It gives me a chance to sort of learn things that I don't know to push to the very limits of what I'm able to understand. I sometimes, you know, bring on guests that are really advanced and I ask them not to pull any punches and they don't. And so hopefully you're learning as much as I am with the interviews. When you see a new interview pop up on our channel, like don't skip it. Trust me, I think you'll enjoy it. But if you like, don't have a lot of time, like play it at fast speed or like listen to it as a podcast. And I think you'll still get a lot out of these interviews. Like this is journalism, we are learning new things about the universe from the people who are making the discoveries, I'm able to go right to the source. And so if you want to hear about stuff first, this is the way to do it. Watch the interviews. Dragonfly is delayed. 
All right, one of the missions that I'm most excited for is the Titan Dragonfly. This is NASA's mission to Titan. It's going to be a helicopter powered by a RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. So in other words, it's going to be able to fly in the heavy atmosphere of Titan from spot to spot, be able to analyze the chemicals on the surface, sample the atmosphere. It's going to be amazing. And like, it just blows my mind that there could be a helicopter flying on Titan within the next decade. And so this week, we've got some good news and some bad news about the Titan Dragonfly. So the good news is that NASA has approved the mission to move to phase C. And this is where they do the final design for what the requirements of the mission are going to be. So that's great, they're moving forward. Now the bad news is that the final confirmation of the mission, like the final go ahead that yes, indeed, there will be a helicopter going to Titan. That won't happen until 2024. So we'll find out the final schedule and the final budget then. Already it looks like the launch date has been pushed back to 2028, which means the arrival date has been pushed back. So like, don't, don't think about when it's gonna get there. Just like, just focus on that next milestone. This is what it would be like to orbit Mars. We got just an incredible image from NASA this week that came from the Mars Odyssey spacecraft. This is one of the most long lived missions at Mars, produced an enormous amount of data. And so mission controllers wanted to push the spacecraft a little out of its comfort zone. And what they did was see if they could change the angle of orientation of the spacecraft. Now, Mars Odyssey is set in a way that its Themis camera, this is the main camera that it uses, is pointing directly down at the surface of Mars. And so in order to get this amazing image of the horizon of Mars, they had to turn the entire spacecraft to reorient it so that it could take images of the horizon. But when they were doing this, they lost contact with the spacecraft because not only is the camera turned in a new direction, its transmitter home was offline. So they had to give it the instructions and trust that it was gonna move back after it was done. Once they got all these images, they stitched it together into this amazing mosaic and Odyssey is at an altitude of about 400 kilometers above the surface of Mars. And so when you think about this, this is the same altitude as the International Space Station around Earth. And so if you were in orbit around Mars, this is what you'd see. Finally, we got our first full view of the Chinese space station seen from orbit. This image of the Tiangong Chinese space station was captured by the crew of the Shenzhou 16 mission. And these are the people who were on board the Chinese space station and they were recently replaced by the Shenzhou 17 crew. And so they captured this image as they were leaving the station, headed back to earth. Now I'm gonna talk about the Starship launch in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Chiplin, Modzo, George, David Gilton, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Mattern, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. Now, we had a great episode this week where I brought on Marcus House and Scott Manley to talk about the Starship launch. And if you haven't seen it, you should watch it because we kind of go into great detail and both of them are very knowledgeable about Starship. And it's funny because last week on Space Bites, I sort of gave a quick overview of what happened with the Starship launch and people were just brutal in the comments about me being a SpaceX fanboy. And this is hilarious because in previous times, people are just brutal in the comments about me being a SpaceX hater. And so, I am both seen, in some cases, in the same video. People say that I am a hater and other people say that I am a SpaceX fanboy. And the reality is that I attempt to be neutral. I try to describe the facts as I see them and not get overly emotional about all of the stuff that's associated with it. And I know that a lot of people have concerns about the person who is in charge of this company. And yet there are thousands of dedicated engineers working at this company, at SpaceX. You've got Gwyn Shotwell, who is running the show there, who are doing some of the most incredible work that is pushing humanity into space. And so everything has shades of gray, nothing's black and white. And so I think you can both be concerned about the behavior of a leader and at the same time excited by the progress of the company. And seeing Starship launch, seeing how far they made it this time, knowing that most of the roadblocks seem to have been removed to see in more tests, and eventually we'll get to this point of a fully reusable two-stage rocket. 
I can't wait. And even if SpaceX is the company to do it, we've got other companies that are learning their lessons. We've got Rocket Lab, theoretically Blue Origin, although we still need them to launch a rocket. The Chinese are working on fully reusable two-stage rocket designs. So this idea is now out there.